Welcome to the SPE Podcast, powered by the Society of Petroleum Engineers. You're listening to SPE Live Gaia Talk, rigs to reefs, from oil production to ocean habitat. The audio from this episode was previously recorded on September 13th, 2023. And now your moderator, Dwayne Purvis. Good morning and welcome. My name is Dwayne Purvis and you are now attending SPE Live Gaia Talk on rigs to reefs from ocean, uh, from oil production to ocean habitat. My name is Dwayne Purvis. I am the founder and principal advisor of Purvis Energy Advisors. But more importantly, we have with us two experts. Uh, It's my pleasure to introduce our guests, Amber Sparks and Emily Hazelwood, who are both marine scientists. They started out together at uh, University of California, San Diego's uh, Scripps Institute for uh, Ocean Institution of Oceanography. And then together they founded Blue Latitudes, which is recognized as a leader by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine uh, and a beautiful spread in National Geographic as leaders uh, developing creative, sustainable, and cost-effective solutions for environmental issues that surround the offshore oil and gas industry. Uh, They're also co-founders and co-presidents of Blue Latitudes Foundation. Together, they're committed to elevating the scientific understanding of our oceans in communities around the world. And together, they've led scientific research expeditions, supported the production of documentary films from Malaysia to the Kingdom of Tonga that highlight opportunities for conservation at the intersection of industry and the environment. Good morning, Amber and Emily. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Good morning. So uh, I think we're coming in from all over the country today and uh, glad to talk about uh, an issue that affects not just the U.S., but a lot of other countries. And I understand from uh, reading the talking we've done that you guys have worked a lot of those. But first, tell me the background. So I, um, you guys went to the Scripps Institution, which, as I understand it, is pretty much the combination of Harvard and MIT for the purpose of marine biology. Uh, so I, I can't imagine that you started out your career wanting to uh, wanting to support oil and gas, wanting to work with oil and gas. Uh, tell me about your where you guys came from and how you got to this place. Of course, yeah. No, I, it's a it's a funny question because people ask that of us a lot. And no, I did not grow up as a little girl wanting to study oil platforms. Um, yeah, I, me interest- neither. For what it's worth. <laughs> My interest in the program, I'm originally from New Hampshire, I live there now, but my interest in the program stemmed from um, right out of undergrad, I had the opportunity to go work on the uh, BP oil spill. I graduated in 2011, so for me, that was a very big event. This spill happened in 2010, and it was still very much ongoing by the time I graduated in the spring. And so I got an opportunity to go down there and work as a field technician working on um, studying the... um, the biota, the marine life, as well as sediment and the water, and understanding the full extent and impact of the spill. And while I was down there, we worked with a lot of local fishermen who would drive our sampling boats around. And every time we'd be out there, they'd be talking about how they couldn't wait for the weekend so they could get out there and go fishing on the oil platforms. And at the time, that seemed bizarre because from my perspective, wasn't one of these oil platforms the main cause of this oil spill? Why would you ever want to eat fish that came from an oil platform? And so that was the first time I learned about the Rigs to Reach program and what a pivotal role it plays in the Gulf of Mexico in terms of supporting fisheries and the vibrant ecosystems that are actually found on these offshore structures. So when I decided to pursue my graduate degree and attended Scripps Institution of Oceanography, I met Amber and Amber enlightened me that California also has oil and gas platforms, but unlike the Gulf that was actively reefing their structures, California hadn't reefed any of their oil platform structures. And we set out to answer that question as to why that was. Did you figure it out, Amber? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, we spent our entire graduate work really looking at the feasibility of a rigs to reef program in California from an economic, social, and ecological perspective. And what we found is that in California, they're some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, more productive than our natural coral reefs. There are these fantastic ecosystems. And we realized, you know, there might be ecosystems like this on oil platforms around the world. And could we find opportunities to conserve and protect those ecosystems when it comes time to decommission? So when we graduated from Scripps, Emily and I co-founded Blue Latitudes, which is our marine environmental consulting firm. And we worked directly with both governments and offshore energy companies to assist them in looking at their offshore structures on a case-by-case -case basis, which ones would make viable reefing habitats and which ones should be completely removed. A lot of our work involves using remotely operated vehicles or ROVs to assess the platform habitat beneath the water. We take videos of the beams and cross beams, the scaffolding of this platform jacket to look and assess at the marine life that's been developing there since the moment th those structures were installed. Much of our work has taken place in the Gulf of Mexico, but we also have project work in California, M Malaysia, Thailand, Mauritania. We've worked around the world on repurposing these offshore oil and gas structures into artificial reefs. Okay, so you, you, you mentioned it just there, and I want to come, come back to sort of to rewind. I realize the title is kind of obvious, but uh, rigs to reefs, would you unpack what that means and what's the value proposition? Who gets what out of it? Yeah, absolutely. So Riggs to Reef is an alternative to complete platform removal at the end of end of a production life. So, and this isn't just for fixed standing structures. We've also worked on spar facilities and in the super deep sea working on subsea pipelines, plets, uh, manifolds, things like that, that you might find down in the super deep sea. So this is an alternative to completely removing all of that infrastructure at the end of life, where a portion of that structure remains in the water column to continue to function as an artificial reef. And there are three big benefits. The first is the ecological benefits that you see from retaining that marine life and that marine habitat. Usually it has an important impact on fishery stakeholders because you're sustaining important fisheries habitat. Another major win is for the industry because there's usually a significant cost savings associated with leaving a portion of that infrastructure in place. And in some cases, the infrastructure is too large to be taken on shore, to be dismantled, or perhaps there's sa you know, safety concerns in removing it. So there can be a major cost savings associated with reefing. And then the last benefit is for the state. Usually, at least in the Gulf of Mexico and in states like California, there's a cost sharing in, uh, of the cost savings. So the oil companies are saving a lot of money, but they also need to make a donation to the state. And that money funds an endowment for marine preservation and conservation. So it will fund departments of fish and wildlife and other research initiatives that are doing local conservation. So it's a really a win, 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 win for the environment, win for industry and win for the state. No, the, uh, I think that's great. I, I, lo uh, I love the, the triple win. Um, but I have questions about the value of, of each of those. So you said it's a significant cost savings. Um, you know, if, if I if I saved uh, personally a million dollars, that'd be a huge cost savings to me, but not so much for an oil company. I, what kind of proportion of cost savings when this can be applied? What kind of proportion of cost savings are we talking about or what kind of scale? Well, it's quite significant. I mean, decommissioning costs can range significantly based on platform age, its location, its size. But if you were to use, you know, an, an average number, a hundred million dollars, well, if you were going to reef that structure, it would cost roughly half that amount. So only fifty million dollars. But that fifty million dollars, <laughs> as Amber stated, yeah. gets split. So twenty-five million yeah. back to the stakeholders within the oil company, and then twenty-five percent going back to the state. So we're talking big numbers here, and that's just yeah. an average structure. Yeah, I, I love it. A, a million here, a million there. Pretty soon we're talking about real money. Um, 
But I, I love the fact that you guys get to go look at these, uh, drive ROVs around and look at what amounts to coral reefs. Um, I think I remember uh, reading that a single platform structure can represent multiple acres of habitable land. So is this something that really is good for the environment, good for the, the wild world? And for how long is it, or is this um, something that is just, you're going to make a big splash and um, so to speak, but really not much of an impact. So it really depends on the platform. It's a, it's a case by case basis. And this also kind of goes for your cost saving question, because like Emily mentioned, there can be significant cost savings, but it, that cost savings can really vary by where you're located, where you're decommissioning. So in an area like the Gulf of Mexico, where they're routinely installing and decommissioning platforms, there's a lot of infrastructure on shore for those operations. And so costs are down. But in places like California, we don't have the infrastructure on shore and we don't have the large barges and all the material that you would need to easily decommission a structure. So our decommissioning costs in California are much higher because we would have to bring in vessels through the Panama Canal up into you know, the port of Long Beach to assist in some sort of decommissioning. So that can be a big range in, in the decommissioning costs and the savings associated sure. with reefing. And the same goes for the ecosystems. In some areas, you might find thriving reefs that are associated with the platforms, but it really depends on where those structures are. It depends on a couple factors, but where are they located? What type of complexity is associated with the structure? So a more complex structure is going to have a richer environment because you have more nooks and crannies. There's more real estate for the marine life to develop on. The placement of the structure, like I mentioned, is important. So if you have a structure placed at the mouth of the Mississippi River, it's not going to be as successful as a platform that's out in a blue water environment because that platform is getting all the sedimentation and runoff from the Mississippi River, which might be impacting the the marine life and habitat on the structure. And the last component for assessing a successful reef would really be age. How long has it been in the water column? Once that structure was initially installed, it pioneering small species begin to associate with the platform. And then over time, these larger, more robust ecosystems form. And over a set period of time, like 20, 30 years, you might have a thriving ecosystems with apex predators like sharks and things like that that are associated with the platform. And so those are some of the components that might make for a thriving reef. Man, that's that was great. And I love I love the fact you say it depends. And most things, uh, most answers, it's true. It, it depends. Um, but how how much are we speculating? Um, how long have we been doing rigs to reefs? And, we'll, and based on what we've learned there, how long can we expect this ecosystem that we hope to create to continue to exist? Well, the the best I guess that we have is to look to shipwrecks. And even that's not a very good example because ships are made from materials that aren't made to be on the ocean bottom for a long period of time. They're made out of very different components versus an oil platform, which is made out of galvanized steel typically. So we would guesstimate that if a platform was to be reefed, that we would see about 500 to 600 years before we see any sort of breakdown of the structure. The Reef Reefs program has been around since the late 1980s, and since that time, well over 500 platform structures have been reefed. And since that time, we've not noted any impacts from any sort of hurricanes damaging the structures. Um, but again, this program is fairly new. It's only about 30 years old. So we don't really have a good estimate as to how long these structures could last in the water column. But we do know they're made out of materials that are made to be in the water column for a long period of time. And it's a great point. Uh, and I, I love the fact that this solution has been around for uh, 30 years. We have some track record. And I, I love the idea that it'll last that long. And you know, I, I grew up fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, I used to consider myself a conservationist. But at, at this point, I think it's not enough to try to conserve and prevent from destruction. Uh, I think what we really need to do is try to be uh, try to make the world thrive. Um, a, a thrivist, uh, I'm a th- 
thrivest now, a thrivent. But uh, the, the fact that this could last for hundreds of years is really, really impactful for the sports fishermen decades from now can uh, can catch a nice grouper and, and Lord willing, let it go. Um, so I, you said before, it kind of depends uh, on, but you can't do it everywhere. Uh, but it sounds like you've done it all over the world. And one of the, one of the folks on LinkedIn was asking um, how suitable, generally speaking, would a subtropical environment be and what kind of water depths uh, would be uh, optimal? Now, realizing it's, you know, it's not going to work everywhere. Some places it would. What about a subtropical? What kind of wa- water depths would work? Well, you know, in a subtropical zone, we're going to see a lot of thriving coral species, so a lot of warm water species that like those upper photic zones. So those are the zones closest to the surface. But Amber and I would argue that the, all zones of an oil platform are valuable. We've seen really unique marine life down hundreds, even thousands of feet down. It's just a different environment. So at the surface, it's much more technicolor. You see a lot more abundance. So that means number of individuals. But in the deeper zones, we may see less abundance, so fewer numbers of individuals, but we actually see higher biodiversity. So that means more species, less individuals. So really all of the zones are very um, important to the ecosystem. But an oil platform in a subtropical zone will start to attract and initially produce marine life right away. So we, we have a good example of this in California. And although that's not subtropical, the platforms in California routinely get cleaned down to about 60 feet. And so we have this running experiment, really, where we can see how quickly marine life can grow and colonize on the structure every couple of years. So we do know that this happens very, very quickly. And so what you're looking for is beyond that attraction versus production question. So we want to be producing marine life. So fish are spawning on the oil platform rather than just being temporarily attracted to the structure. And that production takes a little bit longer to occur. But again, this is a very fast process. You can get a very thriving, healthy ecosystem within five years. Dang. And uh, the the fact that you have environments from the top to the bottom, I suppose, also means that um, a number of locations and a number of designs are suitable. Um, Is that a good assumption? Yes, absolutely. So as Amber mentioned, we've seen um, these ecosystems on spar structures, on deep sea templates. We've seen them on pipelines. We've seen them on multi-leg structures. But what we do find is that we find the most robust, healthy ecosystems on more complex structures. So with lots of beams and cross beams, as opposed to a monopile structure or very simplistic structure. Marine life will always be attracted to very complex structure. Um, This makes sense. You know, imagine if you're a hunter, you're not going to go find a lot of wildlife in a big open area where there's no place for them to hide. So a structure that's very complex provides a lot of refuge and habitat for a variety of species. So those platforms that are very deep, those platforms that have a lot of complex structure, those tend to make for the best ecosystems. Well, and it's, it seems like the what you're talking about is a complete ecosystem, right? From crustaceans to minnows and all kinds of things, all the way up to large fish. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You see anything from small invertebrates, scallops and enemies, different corals, to some of the larger fish species that could include anything from a recreational, commercially valuable fish to some of the larger, you know, top of the food train fish like sharks and things like that, that are associated with the structure. All right. So um, I I love, I'm I'm here in Tulsa, which is where the Garth Brooks got his start. And uh, I love one of his old songs. It says, it was bound to happen. And one day it did. Papa came home and it was just us kids. Now, for those of you who may not be old enough to the song, I apologize, but I'm not going to sing it. Um, and one day, our uh, our platforms are going to need decommissioning. It's bound to happen, and one day it will. So is this, uh, is Reeks to Reef something we can, uh, we need to plan for, or is it something we can just kind of do on a whim at the end of the day, <laughs> as if any multiple million dollar project could be done at the whim at the end of the day? Yeah, plan- planning with the end in mind is 
a critical component to successfully reefing a structure because the more data that you've collected over the lifespan of the structure, the more information, the the better case you have that it's going to be a thriving reef and an important part of the localized habitat. So one way you could do that is to just take a look at some of the maybe maintenance footage that you've been collecting on the structure. So using ROV video footage of the platform that maybe was collected to ensure the integrity of the structure. But from that footage, you may begin to assess a baseline of what's so what life is associated with that structure. So a lot of the work that we do, sometimes we start there. We want to establish a baseline and then do several years of ROV based marine life surveys on the structure to build a case that there is an important habitat associated with the platform. And all of this goes into reporting and permitting compliance um, for reefing. Uh yeah, great. I appreciate that. Um, you know, my my work on shore has um, and with some sample cash flows from offshore shows that the costs of decommissioning can commonly take um, ten, even ten to fifteen years of cash flow. The last ten to fifteen years of cash flow can equal a total cost. And I, and so what I'm telling people on shore is it's it's never too early um, when you if you buy it. You've got a plan on burying it. We have some other questions coming in from uh, from online and some some interesting questions I hadn't thought of. Uh, is there um, any destruction to the habitat temporarily in the process of reefing or, or is it just continuous uh, growth upwards or is there is there a dip, a harm in the process? It's a good question. And it really does depend on the type of reefing that we do. But, for example, there's. There's, you know, four different ways really that you can reef a structure. You could tow it to an alternative location. In those situations, we've actually had studies and we've seen video where the fish actually followed the platform as it was being dragged to another location. So we know there's site fidelity from a lot of these fish species, even if their home does get temporarily moved. So where we see the greatest impact is on um, a lot of more of the Uh, sessile species, the corals, those species that are attached physically to the platform. If a platform is toppled onto its side as a reef, if the upper portion is removed and placed on the seafloor bottom, that's where we're going to see more impact to those species that are directly attached to the structure. Um, But again, with fish, they're much more mobile and they're able to move or adapt to the platform's new location. And if you do topple a structure onto its side, if you do remove the upper portion and place it onto the seafloor bottom, there will be a temporarily a temporary lapse in how much marine life is on the structure. But over time, as I mentioned earlier, it, it comes back quite quickly. And you might see different species, species that colonize in those deeper depth zones. And as I mentioned before, those depth zones are important. In California, we see a lot more of the breeding species happen to occur at the base of the platform structure. We're not finding fish breeding at the top, they're breeding at the bottom. So really all different zones are very important. And even though there might be a temporary impact, it's temporary. Okay, that's that's great. So what about the uh, the oil company on an ongoing basis? It saved money initially, but this is another question from, from LinkedIn. They're saving money initially, but what kind of long-term liability do they have? Are they trading a temporary cost savings for a larger long-term liability? Liability is a really important question. And in areas like the Gulf of Mexico, the liability is transferred to the state and the state manages the liability of that platform as a reef in perpetuity. So they are managing any sort of maintenance costs and the liability is no longer on the operator. Though they'll always be responsible for the liability of the well itself when it comes to that platform jacket, they've transferred it to the state. And that's a part of their agreement through permit it as a reef as well as a part of their donation agreement. So when they give a portion of the cost savings to the state into that endowment for marine preservation, they're funding that sort of long-term maintenance that the state is taking on in that liability. Now that's the case in the Gulf of Mexico, but in places like California, the liability within our rig reef law is not, not as clear. It's not so black and white and it doesn't necessarily necessarily designate the liability 
that the liability would be transferred to the state. And so that creates an issue because the oil companies are not necessarily interested in reefing if they're if they have to maintain that liability in perpetuity. Like you mentioned, that's going to be a big risk for them. There's it could be could, potential costs or other other issues that would come up with retaining that liability. So that that creates a, a big issue. And we've seen the most success when there's been a transfer of liability to the state because the state manages other artificial reefs offshore. It's kind of a it's a part of what they do through their artificial reefing programs. So if these structures are being incorporated into those programs, it would make sense that the state would ret- take on that liability. Well, you, you mentioned that there have been some projects in other parts of the world. Southeast Asia, for example, has a number of offshore platforms. It, it sounds like uh, maybe those places would benefit from creating some of the same legal uh, arrangements, and protections that exist on the Gulf of Mexico. Is that about right? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. In, in Southeast Asia, it's a, a little bit of a different story because they're many of the oil companies are state owned. And so it's a, there's not like a transfer of liability because they're owned by the state. So the state retains that liability anyway. So it's a, um, that in Southeast Asia can be a little bit of a different, of a different story. Right. Uh, there are offshore platforms in um, a lot of places in Africa too. It, seem, it seems like that it is a, an extensible solution. But what about um, repurposing? One of the questions on uh, online came about: Is there an alternative, or maybe a complementary repurposing of the platforms that's also available? Yeah, absolutely. We've definitely examined that opportunity. It's you know again. It really depends on the platform structure. So in California, we have some of the oldest, some of the largest platform structures. So retrofitting one to be used for an alternative use, while not an impossibility, is much more expensive as opposed to a structure that's perhaps in the Gulf of Mexico that's much newer, um, that doesn't need as much of that retrofitting. It's not from the 60s or 70s. You know, There's not asbestos in the walls of the structure. So you really want to think about the type of structure that you're looking at. But where we have seen this opportunity examined is with offshore aquaculture, as well as um, offshore energy storage, as well as offshore wind power. Um, there's actually a jackup rig in Southeast Asia that's been converted into an ecotourism resort. Um, Amber and I actually stayed there on a uh, research expedition. It's a very unique experience. I'm, I'm so jealous. Yeah, it was fantastic. So, you know, I think we have examined that question. Um And we've also heard about um, folks looking into turning these structures into research stations, which we think is brilliant because, you know, there's very few people that get access to a marine lab that far offshore. So the data that you collect is quite valuable. It all comes down to cost. Maintaining an offshore structure is expensive. Um, So that's the biggest factor there. And that's the only reason where people have been turned away is either the platform age or the cost of maintaining the structure in the water column. What a, what a fascinating set of, of questions and dilemmas. And uh, it, it's something that has world worldwide application, not not universal, but uh, but broad application and and something that has a very long benefit, uh, something that we know enough about to plan for, it seems like. And what I was asking online, do we have the opportunity to plan for this from the beginning? Do we have the opportunity to plan uh, rigs from the beginning to be better reefs? Do we have the opportunity to plan offshore windmills or other offshore structures from the beginning to be better habitat when we're done? Yeah, absolutely. They, I think we can look at the offshore oil and gas industry and take some lessons learned when we're moving forward into new energy development offshore, such as offshore wind, developing those structures smarter. So making those structures more complex so that they can function not only as energy generation turbines, but also as potential marine habitats for the ecosystems that are in that localized area. So that's definitely an opportunity. And we've been in a lot of discussions on the East Coast where they're really initiating and doing a lot of offshore wind development to look at the oil and gas industry and start to think about these structures as more than just wind turbines, but how can we 
develop and place them in areas that would maximize their, you know, mm -hmm. the positive impact they could have on the marine environment and potentially mitigate some decommissioning risks, you know, with that eventual end of life that all structures are going to have offshore. So I'm sure, I thank you for that. I am sure that uh, you guys could talk uh, at length, much longer than the time we have uh, about the details of all this. Um, I, I understand that you guys are uh, be happy to answer questions if somebody had others, but for now we're out of time. Uh, let me tell you, thank you on behalf of the SPE and also thank you personally as a conservationist slash fisherman slash thrivist for the work you're doing. Appreciate you being here today and I look forward to seeing your work in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and other places. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the SPE Live podcast. For more content, visit the SPE Energy Stream, the industry's digital pulse at streaming.spe.org. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and review. Join us next time on the SPE Live podcast.